how often do you get a once in a lifetime opportunity? Well, the definition is only once, right? In my situation, I got it twice. Um, I had an opportunity to build a control room in uh, 2008, and we were happy and okay with that. And then in 2012, I got the, the same opportunity to do it once more. And with the information of 2008, and I think also the advancements that we uh, noticed in the market, you know, I think it was for us kind of a step to go to the control room of the future and also to support the operator of the future. I'm going to talk about uh, a building that's uh, called OC1001, Hydrocarbons Command Center, and it is located uh, in Freeport. I'm the automation leader for the Gulfstream program, and that's a $7 billion investment in the Gulf Coast. It's about 60,000 I.O., divided over 14 plants, about 10 new ones, and um, four rejuvenations. Um, and there, is, there are three world-scale plans involved, um, and two of those are at Oyster Creek. So, and world-scale means, in Texas definitions, the largest of the world. So, PDH1, we just started up. It's the largest in the world, and also the Cracker, we're going to start up next year. It's going to be the largest in the world. So, I think, so if you have to build a new control room for two of those giant suckers, what do you do? Do you kind of cram them into an existing control room? Is that a good option? Or do you kind of take a step back and say, okay, we have an opportunity here to do something, to build something for the future. So, and I'm going to tell you about the process we took and some of the challenges we had and the final result. So this is uh, OC1001. It's a blast proof building. And does it look elegantly? Elegantly for you? No, not really. Eh? It's not kind of, but it's kind of uh, blast proof. I think, given that it's blast proof, it has some angles to make it a bit prettier. You can see here the entrance, and this is the name of the building of 2001. So the outside is not what counts, it's the inside what counts here. And if you look at it, um, well, the outside plays a big role because it's blast proof, you know, it's near an ethylene plant. So operators at least are secure under all circumstances. Plus, this building is also hurricane proof, which is kind of a nice little detail if you uh, work and live in the Gulf Coast. Okay, um, so if you start this uh, endeavor, so we first made a conclusion, let's not grow into an existing control room. And the way we did that is explain to the production leader what we had to do. And so we got, well, this is like brain surgery. I said, let's not do that, because you know, if you trip a plant you know, quickly, you, you have a lot of millions of losses, and then those losses could be already a start, starting point for your new building. So we came to a conclusion, let's build a new plant, and also given the fact that the plant will not be near the operations, not in the center, but in, on the side. So there are many criteria, and if you, I would ask you guys, hey, what would be your main criteria? Yeah, you will have, I think, pr pretty quickly a list, as long as your arm. There are two vital ones if you build a new control room. It's the ergonomics, so how to build something where operators feel comfortable and safe and productive. And the other one is cost. No matter what you do, you always have to present a business case to project leadership to say, why are we doing it this way? What is the added benefit? And I think um, we had most of those discussions at the very beginning, and we could seal those discussions off so we could go forward and ensuring that we had a good ergonomic design. The one thing you could also say, hey, Dow Chemical, you know, 2015, why are you still building a control room? So we considered also the option not having a control room. But for these large plants, which are pretty complex, integrated with the site, you know, we came to a conclusion, you need to have some type of control room. You can prepare a lot of stuff for going without a control room, but you cannot start without a control room. So we basically decided, if you build one, let's make sure that you build one that is good and also integrates all the parts of the organization that are close to manufacturing, so that you have kind of a large building where it can, people can meet each other and kind of connect with each other easily, like have serendipity type moments, 
uh, going forward. So you have to make it future proof. You're building something in 2012, they're designing it, and you're building it in 2014, and it has to last at least 20 years. Well, that's a challenge, I can tell you. Because what is really acceptable you know, in 20 years from now? And we have a nice example. Um, one of the plants is in Cracker that uh, started up in uh, 91, Lada Carbons 8. And that was seen still as state of the art. Let me tell you what state of the art means. You have computer floors. So guess what they wanted in this new building? Let's have computer floors. Oh, fantastic, you know, we, it's so flexible and da 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 da. You can pull additional wires. So I brought one of the INE techs to the computer floor. Can you please open it for me? They open it, a whole bunch of spiders and other stuff. So are you comfortable putting your hand in there? I'm not. <laughs> Texas, snakes, rats, etc. Of course, it will not be there, but I think basically it's also hygienic, it's not very good. So we decided. Uh, let's go a bit further than state of the art 1990. Let's go what I think state of the art today. So, and then you have to think about how do the operators interface, you know, with the process. So think about your own situation at home. Who has still a CRT television? Who dares to raise his hand? And <laughs> no, I think nobody. Everybody will have a flat screen, at least 40 inches. So you bring an operator to a control room environment where you have a CRT of 20 inches and it's dark. So, I mean, you have to make sure that you match at least what operators have at home or even better. So that they feel, hey, this is really an advanced environment to do a difficult job. So you have to kind of future-proof it as well so that you have flexible enough to kind of integrate new um, developments. So you build it for the operator, right? So you have to make sure that he or she is effective in doing his or her role. So, and how effective the operator role is depends on a couple of things. First of all, the operator itself, and then the question is how well is he or she trained on the process, and I think that is a vital part. So if you build the control room for the future, you should also have training facilities that are of the future. So you should have something which mimics your original control room design, where operators can work with a medium fidelity simulation so that they really can you know, test themselves and get practice working with that new control system and that new process. So that is, I think, an important part. You know, operators need to be trained well before they start. And then there's another word I invented. It's called conjugation. Um, what's called HMI interface. Well, first of all, you need to give the operator information. Not too much, not too little. But then basically, okay, now I need to act. I got this information that something is in a critical state. How do I correct it? And there you need to have an easy navigation towards the solution. And if you think about small screens, you know, five layers deep, that won't do it for you. So you have to make sure that the whole navigation works well and he can go to the solution quick. So what is what I call communication, so communication and then the navigation. So those first two are very much around the operator, really kind of, hey, um, the ergonomics and everything that comes along with that. And then of course the plan by itself and the control software, the application, have to be aligned with that. Process engineers, the kind of the natural <clears throat> enemy for the automation engineers, they always screw things up, right? And we can repair it. And of course, it's the other way around as well, but you have to make sure that the design is inherently stable and has kind of a lot of things that will support the operator in um, doing his, his or her role. So, for instance, in our situation, um, we use state-based control for every plant, also for large continuous plants that have a degradation uh, path. So if something trips offline, instead of that the whole plant kind of comes crashing down, we have elegant steps in between for uh, the process to go to. So, and then the operator knows, hey, if this compressor trips, my plant will go to that stage, and all these step points are predefined. Is it a help for the operator? Absolutely. So those type of inherent designs in the application and in the um, uh, automation application will help the operator to do his role well. 
So you can see if you kind of give the right attention early on, um, you will have a control room of the future. So that is the theory. Now practice. To December 2012, the concept of the control room was almost finished. And then we got, uh, an, uh, and basically what they left us was this area. This is basically our playing room for the control room. So we got a, so question is, who will you ask to, to do that? Say, so look at me, Michael, you know, you have done this once before, you can do it, right? Uh, not me. So we got a control room architect from CGM in, involved. Um, we explained that there are three world scale plants um, that had to be controlled from there. And so he interviewed the operators, worked with the team from uh, for all the projects, and basically he came up with this design together with the designer of the building. So it's kind of an integrated team. For about two weeks, they worked kind of feverishly together. And in two weeks, they came up with this design. So this is PDH1, Ladakamus 9, Ladakamus 8. These are the three world scale plants. You can see these are the where the operators work. I'll show you pictures later. And this is an island. And this is kind of an island to protect the operators from a lot of negative influence from people walking into their control environment. Plus, that island is also used for support people, like process automation, maintenance, electrical folks, instrument folks, uh, to work from here and not from the operator area. So you have a very distinct separation between operations and support functions. But what it also does, they're very close and they can communicate quite well. What else do we see here? Well, this is the training environment, quite near. This is the server room, quite near. These are the restrooms, quite near. And this is the cafeteria, quite near. You can see the control room is in the center. And this is the area where you know, permits are issued. So the control room is really in the center of all the things that the operator need. You can also see these big black spots, those pillars. Those are pillars you know, to support the building. And you can see how many we have, right? Wouldn't be, you know, if we would have started late with the design, those pillars would have been already in place and we had to kind of work our way around it. Well, in this situation, we were able to shift those pillars, you know, at least two or three yards so we kind of could fit a control room in there. So that, I think, you know, the pillars became a part of our design rather than a disturbance for our design. Hence, you know, if you start early, you can see, you know, it makes a big difference. So this is kind of the conceptual part. Um, let me go forward. Um, so there are some non-negotiables that things you have to kind of comply with per definition. First, of course, is cybersecurity. So you have to make sure that, you know, attackers, etc., don't have an easy target in this control. Uh, so all the servers and clients are put in a separate room. No dongles available. Uh, no, uh, we can't put any USB ports, uh, we don't have any USB ports. And we put all those in a, in a separate room. Besides cybersecurity, there's another big plus. Every computer or client has a small fan, right? And if you add them all up and you have like 30 clients, they make a lot of noise. So putting it all in one separate room you know, releases the control room from a lot of kind of white noise. Um, and then, of course, while you build it, you have to preview your de design, review it, and finally audit what, when you have built it. So I think the cybersecurity for us played a vital role in kind of separating some stuff. The other aspect is it doesn't do you a lot of good if you have a fantastic HMI if it's not reliable. If you get black streams on a regular basis if things fall out. So what we did is made it redundant in a smart way, so meaning that a single component failure will not lead to an outage for the operator. That means that you have to kind of be smart about your UPSs, about uh, KVM switches, about your network, about your power, etc. So the, something went into that, and you have to test it, by the way, during commissioning startup. And you can see if, if you involve those non-negotiables early enough, you know, they support the control room the future design. So this is the server room. Um, standard stuff, right? Not, nothing fancy. Um, you can see also the badge reader, 
that you have over here before you can enter. So basically it's really a separate room that only select people can enter. So one of the questions is, hey, you know, early on, telecom that you know, has all these networks for uh, the computer said, well, we like to use your room as well. It's kind of handy dandy, you know, it's nice and air conditioned, but why, why can we not put your stuff in there? Well, the answer was pretty simple. Cybersecurity, this is the heart of the brains of our plant. We, want, we do not allow other people there than just people that have a role for automation. The other group said, analyzes. Hey, we'd like to have a stuff in there as well. We have this nice server, da 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 da. We can look at the analyzer. I said, no guys, you have a separate room as well. So that helped us really to keep it really focused on one group only, and that is uh, process automation. Okay, then we continued. Um, I told you already, I'm vintage 1980 as a control engineer. So it means that I'm used to different things. Was really so. I'm used to board operators, and you know everything was quite as nice and here. You could touch things, switches, etc. You could see graphs and trends. Well, this design should kind of mimic a lot of those functionalities in an easy way, but not vintage 1980, but 2020. So I come to this 2020. Why do I put 2020 there? What does 2020 mean for a lot of Americans? 2020 vision. 2020 hindsight. So what we didn't want is to have 2020 hindsight, what we should have done for the control. We want to have kind of a little bit of foresight. Plus, you know, this whole control room will be operational in 2020, so we want to make sure that everything is done well done. But if you look at the operators, what is kind of important is that you have task-oriented sheets for specific phases of the process. During commissioning a startup, you want to have very detailed task-oriented sheets for upset conditions, if you're to compress the trips offline, that hey, these are the sheets that will help you to recover the process as quickly as possible. And last but not least, you know, 90% of the time the process will run smooth, and you need to have a different sheet for that. So we spend a lot of time designing that sheet. Now, I'll show you in a minute. First, this is, of course, you need to integrate that process information with procedures that he needs to do, you know, startup of equipment, um, if SIS instruments uh, basically go offline. So you have a lot of specific procedures that you want to have also easy accessible through the HMI. Last but not least, this is an integrated site, three large scale plants, you know, together with power utilities, you have to make sure all those things are connected well and that you can look at those things at an instant. Our suppliers of feedstock, but also our clients are nearby, so we have to make sure that all that information is integrated uh, so that we can optimize the whole operation. You can see if you look at those criteria and, and you kind of implement them well, again, you support the operator to the future and you get a good control. So this is uh, not an eye chart. The real sheet is as large as, I think this is about, you know, uh, 165 inches wide. I think this is about what it is. And so this is kind of the overview sheet for the plant of the frac site that operators will use during a normal operation. Let me take one thing out. This is a, a small distillation column, 330 feet high, um, 30 feet in diameter. So it's our largest process vessel that we have in Dow. Um, and you can see there's a little line going over it. This is the temperature profile. And the temperature profile is continuously compared with the ideal profile so that the operator knows that if the line is red, I still have some work to do. If the line is blue, you know, I'm in good shape. Plus, he likes to know what the level did the last two hours. So you can see here a little graph to that. Plus, all the parameters you see on this for this uh, fractionation part, these are only the aspects of the information that the operator needs during normal continuous operation. So the goal is within 30 seconds, when he comes on shift, that he knows what the status of the plant is, what needs work, what needs attention, and what basically I cannot go. So this basically, this sheet took a lot of hours uh, to develop. Um, and it was developed actually, the majority of it, in the last three months of commissioning a startup. One guy worked you know, intimately with the operators, asking them, hey, well, how to do this, why? Why do you need this? How would it help you? May I suggest something else? So 
so that we, instead of just fulfilling the wish of the operator, we fulfilled his needs. And right now I think this sheet is being used like 90% of the time. And this is kind of one of those task sheets that I refer to. It's a 23 inch. And basically you use it kind of, hey, if you have a specific task, this is for starting up a furnace. If you follow the task sheet, it tells you what to do, what are the issues, and basically when you're done. So those two sheets, I think, helps the operator a lot. And it gives him actually the information that he needs at certain points of time. Again, why? Well, this is the control of the future. So instead of having all these things three layers deep, he has that on a large screen available for him. Last but not least, ergonomics. A very popular word. How often are we really applying it? Most of us work behind you know, a screen at least six hours per day, right? And we do that ergonomically, right? Well, for the operators, it's 12 hours per day. Um, so the real question is how to make this environment attractive for him so that it has a wow effect. So he comes into the control, hey, I want, I want to work here, this is a good environment. So for many years in rural conditions, like I said, you know, commissioning a startup, and so that you have at least 30 people that are in the control room, or when he's there by himself, when uh, things run kind of uh, stably. So communication, I explained, and of course you have to support the latest insights about layout, about lighting, about temperature, about noise, etc. So all those things have to be worked in. And last but not least, the workflow, how to make sure that what he needs to do is kind of elegantly woven into the design so that he doesn't have to do additional things. So how successful were we? Now this is uh, how the control looks today. This is uh, during commissioning a startup. And those guys are wearing yellow shirts because if you go outside during construction, you have to wear a yellow shirt so you're more visible. That explains a bit of that. They were just about to start up one of the large motors. Um, you can see here there's about eight or nine people here, plus there are 10 more over here behind that island that I just explained. So you can see that how the whole layout supports actually commissioning a startup, not just for the operation, but for the whole crew. So that is, I think, a very important aspect that they kind of started to enjoy. This is Nathan, one of the operators. You can see he's laughing comfortably. His process is running well. These are the, the small screens and this is the big screen. You can see you can put the table up and down. The lighting here um, basically is bluish, so to help uh, to keep the operator alert. The screens can go both back and forth to also help the operators uh, with their eyes. So how, how was this evaluated by the operators? First of all, um, the builder came in two weeks ago to ask operators about their assessments and did we meet the goals. Um, their, their formulation was, we're Cadillacing. This is fantastic. This is like you know a large American car going over a nice piece of asphalt. It's fantastic for us. They really enjoyed that control room. So the operators, I think, are happy. Um, last September, one of our executives, the number two in Dow Chemical, came to visit this control room. He asked a couple of questions. He didn't show his excitement. The next day, he dropped in with a lot of other folks from other companies, like CEOs and number twos, to show our new control room. So he was so proud of the control room, he wanted to show to our competition how it looked today. So also there, operators checking the box, senior leadership check in the box. How about young folks? Well, one of the sons of the construction people came to me. He said, hey, Michiel, this is a nice environment. What do I need to do to be able to work here later? This is such an inspiring env environment. I said, well, you know, finish a college degree and y you get the chance to work here. So I think all those things, you know, show that at least the users and the owners enjoyed it. Uh, we were awarded control room of the year. Um, for this effort, and I'm, I'm glad to hear that because you know, a lot of people were involved, so I think it's good to see that that got recognized. So I think you know, we're happy with the final result. And of course, the one way to really test that, you know, how well are we doing? So this is a licensed plant, licensed technology. So we asked the licensor, we like to know how well we're doing asset utilization wise compared to the other plants, give us some feedback. So now basically the jury is out, the plant is running for about you know, six weeks, and we're going to compare how it runs uh, with the competition to see whether some of the things we put in there are helping us. 
So what are some three, three simple rules of advice for you guys if you have to do a control room? Number one, start early. Make sure that before the drawings of the building are finished, that your control room drawings are in there as well. So work with the architect of the building, work with a uh, control room architect, so start early. Don't finish early. Continue your effort until the very end, until your HMI are really optimal. Because that's really what the operators, you know, what the operators will use going forward. Every day, every time. So having that additional investment on, on graphics may seem like, wow, how do I kind of justify that? I think if you look at how it works, it gives you a big benefit. Last but not least, if you think about it, you know, Dow Chemical, you know, we have 50,000 employees. Oh, we have plenty of experts, you know, many, even for control room design. My advice is, yes, they are ex experts, but they are experts in the previous design. So if you want to build, to build something new, you have to make sure that you get uh, information from the industry, from experts, to then help you to design a new control room. So don't be shy getting other people involved uh, early on in the process when you make your conceptual design. For us, I think it was a breakthrough. Um, and I think so for me, that is one, I think the most important lesson learned, make sure you get the experts involved early. So I think criteria, experts, listening to the end user, and basically then monitor closely while you start up, and basically it will set the grounds for the control of the future and the operator of the future. Thank you for your attention, and if you have questions, I'll be here. Go.